Um, so, so this morning, and um, we're going to be talking about data management plans. Um, basically, b both the both morning sessions will be will be talking about it in a couple of different ways. First, we're going to talk about the um, basics of a good data management plan, and then I'm going to show you some tools and resources to help with with creating a plan. Um, so that's we'll do an overview of what a data management plan is, and this everything that you're talking about this week goes into the data management planning process. So um, I'm, some things I'm just going to be touching on quickly. Greg did a great job yesterday with metadata and vocabulary, so I'm not going to go too much, much into that. Then we'll look at some of the, cool, the, the tools. We have some practice exercises. And then this afternoon, um, you're actually going to be doing creating a, da a data management plan. Um, so if you were to go to Google and look for data management planning resources, there are more than anyone could ever want to look at. Um, a lot of universities have um, have, have websites up with, with guidance. Um, there are there are checklists. There are questions. There are all sorts of um, different different ways of looking at it. And um, I, the Australian National Data Service is, is one of the um, places where you can get some great information about what goes into a data management plan. So um, first we're going to th go through theirs and then I'm going to look at a couple of other um, recommendations that look at things a little bit differently. For a, the data management planning process, there is not necessarily one authoritative data management plan that tells you um, everything that, that you need to do, there's a lot, it depends. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about first this morning is everything that should be considered in a data management plan and should be considered as close to the beginning of a project as as possible. And I know um, the, the first day some of you talked about, um, you know, how hard it is to get people talking about data management plans and thinking it through. So what we're talking about right now is sort of best case scenario or pie in the sky, probably not going to happen. But these are all of the things that, um, that, that should be happening. More often what happens when people write a data man management plan is they think about what they already know, what they've already sort of decided, and that can leave some gaps that can lead to problems later on. So that's what that's why there's a lot of guidance out there on how to write a data management plan is um, so that people actually think through the whole process. I think Renan said on Monday that he works with graduate students who are working on their PhDs and when they're starting out their research he talks them through the process to actually make sure that they um, Th that they're thinking about all, all of this from, from the beginning and they're not just picking up on the bad habits of their, um, their professors. So the first thing that um, when you're thinking about the data, man data management would be to look at the existing data. What, what do you already have? What projects have you already done? And, um, and how are you going to incorporate that into this project? What are, what, what are you going to be using? What are you going to be needing? Um, and then looking at um, what data you're going to be you you're going to be creating um, for this project and I will say and this will come into effect later on but a data management plan should not be a static document it's something to be thought about at the beginning of the project but you also it needs to you need to come back to the data management plan make sure you're doing what you thought you were going to be doing and um, it really should be iterative and and something that's actually living and, and working. Um, in, the, in the US and in Europe, a lot of data, there's been a lot of focus on data management planning because a lot of funders have required, have started requiring data management plans as a part of the funding process. And we're going to look at that um, more later this morning. But what that does is it creates a document that people submit when they are submitting their funding and at least currently, there's not a whole lot that means that anybody ever goes back and looks at it and says that you were going to do what you did. There's no, the researchers never have to look at it again. Um, so really what, um, all of these things need to be thought about and if you're, if you're going to be 
doing good data management planning, it's not just a one time at the beginning of the project. It's something that always needs to be, um, be thought about. Um, so you've thought about your, the data that you have, sort of roughly what type of data you're going to be creating, um, and then uh, who, who's going to own the data and who, who is going to be interested in it. Um, this is, are you, how open are you going to make the data? Um, is, it, um, is it something that, that you already know? Other people that you're working with are going to be interested in it and you're going to want to make it op more open. Um, are there, uh, are, are, would there be problems with making the data open? Um, so in the beginning, thinking, thinking, starting to think about that. Um, file formats, Greg talked about, about yesterday on, or on Monday. You know, what, what are the best types of formats? And then, of course, what types of metadata will you, what format or standard will you use? And you did a lot with metadata yesterday. Um, these are sort of the best practices for any metadata standard that you're going to be using. Describing, you know, de describing the data, explaining the, the formats for dates, um, coded, coded values, missing values. Um, you know, Renee touched on that on Monday when he was talking about the survey of the transportation riders. And when he got in touch with the person who had actually done the survey, they let him know what the blank cells in Excel meant. So is it missing data? Is it, you know, how do you record a null? Um, all of that are things that, is, as you're planning the project, um, are really important. Um, and all of this, uh, I was working with some, we have, um, on, on our campus, we have people who are working on uh, long-term ecological, uh, long, it's LTERs, long-term ecological research. And they have a station in Alaska where they've been going every summer for the last 30 years. They have one on the coast of Massachusetts, um, and then th those are the those are the two that are managed out of out of MBL where I work. They've been keeping this data for 30 years. Um, when they when people have gone back to actually use the data, they they were keeping it in Excel spreadsheets. Well, the way that the way that people had been recording the dates in Excel had changed, but also there were our problems as Excel has upgraded to new versions. They have changed the way that they read the date. So there are lots of inconsistencies that can happen even if you think that you are, um, even if you're explaining all this in your metadata, it, it, there still are inconsistencies that come up. And it's a lot of work to go back and change that, but at least you know what you're dealing with because you, if, if you've recorded what, what you're doing. Um, sometimes figuring out what the problem is um, is, is as hard as, as, as fixing it. Um, so data organization, talked about this yesterday. You know, how are you going to name your, your files, the folders? How are you going to manage um, the, the transfers and synchronization? How are you going to manage collaborative writing? Um, you know, how are you going to, and then how are you going to keep track of different versions of your of your data files? And we're going to talk a little bit about versioning um, a little bit later. But first, I just wanted to show this because Greg did explain this. But this is um, a colleague of mine who's a, a data librarian at Northeastern University. Um, this is actually. Um, a group of file names that she got from a graduate student. And if you look at them, you can see right away, this is, you know, this is what they have. This is their data for their thesis. And um, besides just awesome and awesomer 2010, um, if you look, they're also um, the 722.10, um, you know, there are two files there that the names look the same, but the words are they have all the same words, but the words are in a different order. Is that the same file they recorded twice, or, you know, is it two different versions? What? So this is this is a mess, but this is real. This is really what people's people's data look like. Um, so it it seems um, it can seem sort of. Um, librarian-ish to at the beginning of your, your project to think about um, you know having those file naming formats described and in the metadata but 
in the long term, it's this is something that people deal with. Um, if any of you are, work as a, as a lab manager or know people who work as a lab manager, this is this, this is real. This is what people are, are looking at. When this graduate student leaves their data and somebody else needs to use it, um, good, good luck with that. So um, that was that one there. So um, and we're, the big question too with, with uh, data and data management is thinking about storage. So um, how, wh where is your data going to be stored? And how, how secure is it? Uh, how much are you going to um, restrict access to that? So if you are going out into the field with a laptop, or if, if you have students going out into the field with a laptop and they're coming back with the data, how secure is the laptop? Are they using a USB drive? When people go out to see what's, what's happening to all of the data, are they using USB drives? How is it getting um, backed up? Really important that there's a process in place to back up all of the, the data. Um, unfortunately, I think you know everybody sort of knows that backing up the data is best practice, but it really um, having an automated backup system where you aren't relying on someone to remember to do it is 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 really. Um, an important part part of the process. So if you can do that, just having things on the hard drive on the computer um, for and not having it backed up for as short a time as possible because things things happen, coffee gets spilled. Um, so this was uh, the University of California in San Diego um, did a um, a survey of their their researchers. They they've done a lot of work with. Um, making within their university because they're they're a big university and they have a supercomputing facility and they can offer people space to store their data um, all kinds of data um, so they did a, a survey of how are people you know how, how are people serve, storing their data a lot of it's stored on hard drive servers in the lab um, USB drives maybe um, you know, maybe backed up on network accessible storage. People are using things like Dropbox. Um, some some are using a tape library, um, but a lot of a lot of different ways that people are storing their data, and maybe not necessarily thinking about the, the safety of things. If you're using something like Dropbox or um, Google or um, Amazon that are proprietary companies they have some rights over your data and you don't necessarily have complete control. Um, also, you know, a lot of people like to use Dropbox for sharing files back and forth, but um, if any of you use Dropbox, you know that you, get in, you can get into trouble with different versions and people uploading and, and downloading. There really isn't a lot of versioning control there. So um, it's important to, um, it, it's important to really think about all the ways all of the data is being saved and how all of that data is getting is getting backed up, um, and so, um, so yeah. So that was what what they found there. It's also it's much cheaper to have a good backup storage um, plan for your data than it is to try to recapture that data or go back and try to and try to rebuild it again. So. Um, it's always better to be prepared. Um, and the, so the best practices for um, preserving your data, um, generally it's a good idea to have three copies of, of any, and this is of any data that, that you're using. Um, you want to have the, an original, then you want to have a saved copy that, mi that might be a server in your um, in your local environment, maybe a server in the lab or in your institution, and then a server someplace else. Because I think most of us are someplace where you know a weather event can wipe out your lab. It's happened places. So having it, having a backup that's physically removed from where you are um, helps that. So that's number two, having them geographically distributed, um, and then having. Um, 
you know, different types of, of, of storage as well. Some sort of a hard drive um, or a tape backup system, and then also some sort of cloud, cloud storage, even if that's going to be a, um, a private, you know, a private company. Um, and, and sometimes it's, sometimes that may be paying to have your data stored someplace probably means that it's safer than just like in a, a free Dropbox account. Um, and then uh, people, if you are using, um, if you have any human subject data, which I don't luckily have to work with people who are working with, even though people are working on, um, on health subjects, they're not using human subjects, but anything with human subjects, immediately, you know, there are all kinds of um, privacy concerns that come in. And so you may need to encrypt your data in that case. Other than that, Unencrypted data um, or encrypting the data can cause problems down the line. So um, the, the more simple you can make it for somebody else to read your data, the better. Because if something goes wrong with the encryption scheme, then again, your data isn't of use to anyone. Um, and then also, you know, keeping track, having a good, um, having a good strategy for keeping track of the passwords and um, or the keys, or the um, if you have a, an encrypted file, so that if something happens to the person who's primarily responsible for the storing the data, that that somebody else can come in and um, and and know how to how to get get to it. Um, so, sorry, I'm to go the other way. Um, so that's that's backing up your data. So there, there's backing up your data and then there's archiving your data. And often, and I probably just did it, but often when we talk about those two things, we talk about them interchangeably. Um, and there, there really are two different, um, two different things that, you, that, you, that you're doing there. Um, they're both you know, they both relate to saving a, a, a specific version of a file. Um, but backing up is when you are um, specifically just making copies of various files with the knowledge that the files may change. And then, you know, a backup can be kept for a certain amount of time. Um, and when you're sure that you don't need that backup anymore, it can be discarded. That's and that's an important thing to have in your data management plan is where the back, not just where the where things are being backed up, but how long that backup lasts and um, when when it is going to be discarded if it's going to be discarded. So at my institution, they do institutional backups and it's easy to get get things backed up, and they only but they only keep it for a certain amount of time. So um, which I. Think I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it might be 60 days that they keep the, the tape backups. After that, they get rid of the data. So it's, it's fine if you, if you think you're only going to need the data to be backed up for 60 days. It's not an archiving scheme, certainly. But knowing that going into it um, is, is important. And so um, archiving is when the file is going to be preserved as it is. And this is when you start thinking about and looking at some sort of data repository that you're going to put your, your data in. Um, it's expensive to archive, of course, all of your raw data is because that's your, when you're talking about archiving, you're talking about keeping it long, long term, preserving it forever. Um, so um, that's different data repositories have different um, different ways uh, ways of dealing that. So. Um, the, what a data repository will do for you is um, they will worry about maintaining the integrity of the data over time. If you are preserving your own data, um, you need to think about um, copying it onto um, a new disk or a new drive every two to five years so that um, if, if things are, are, are being degraded, um, in, in our data library, we have a huge tape library. The, the, it's in a vault that's kept cool, but it's still the, the 
tapes do degrade over time and data can, can be lost. Um, so this is something that if you're keeping your own data um, or if you're responsible for storing data that you would need to think about. Um, and then um, if you are keeping your own data, again, you want to make sure that archiving it, you're using the same archiving practice, practices that you would be using for, for backing it up. So you want to keep it in different forms and in different, in, in different places. Um, so the, um, the recommendations from the Australian National Data Service, I think some librarians obviously were involved here because um, one of their recommendations is to think about um, managing your bibliography. So um, I, I think librarians are probably the only ones who think about that. But um, you know, what, what bibliographic management tools are you going to be using? Are you going to be using something like EndNote? Are you going to be using something like Mendeley? Um, and sharing references with other members of your group. It's, it's an important part in, as on, of your plan is to think about how, how, how everything gets, gets shared. Um, and then what data are you going to share with others as a, as a form of publishing? A lot of journals will require that if you publish an article in their journal, that you deposit the data that supports your article in some sort of repository. Um, some of you may have heard of Dryad, which is a, a data repository. And there are a lot of journals will specifically ask as a part of the article submission process for the DOI of where that data has, has been submitted. Um, you know, traditionally, it was always data is available upon request was, was what people said. Um, and that really, some journals are, are starting to change that right now. There was a brouhaha earlier this year when, um, when the PLOS journals really came out and, str and, and strongly said that they weren't going to accept any articles that didn't have the data archived someplace. Um, and people got, people got upset about it, even though that had always been their policy. Um, when they came out and strongly said, we're not taking any journal articles that don't have a DOI, uh, you know, people people want to hold on to their data, even if it's the data that's supporting their article. Um, responsibilities: you know, Who's going to be responsible for for all of this? And we'll talk about I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the budget um, really needs to be part of the data management plan as well. So there are, um, you know, all of all of this is expensive, and where is the money going to come from if you are creating a data management plan that is supporting a grant application, um, putting, the, putting the, in the budget hardware uh, costs, research assistant time um, for the curation, the metadata. I mean, as you realized yesterday, creating the metadata isn't always easy and isn't always a whole lot of fun. So um, how, how, is that going, how is that going to be done? And then just sort of generally any, anything else that you can think of that's going to support the data that's being managed should be included in your data management plan. Yeah? Do you know of any budget calculators or tools or, or examples or something? Like that's one of the places where I get stuck. Yeah. That's I, I don't know. Um, I think it, you know, it varies. It would vary so widely of to, you know, whether you're trying to preserve terabytes of data or, you know, I mean, that's that's and that's um, there are there are projects that are funded where they want the data to be deposited someplace, um, and and they specifically say that so you could figure out a little bit more easily how much it's going to cost. But it is, it's a tough one. I mean, that's, that's a really tough, 